behalf of Board of Directors of the Heads Consortium, I would like to welcome you to our 2020 Best pra Practices Showcase, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Naila Colobes, and I will be in charge of introducing the speakers of breaking sessions of this room. Although we will have time for questions at the end, the presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your questions in any time during the presentation. This presentation will be in English. We will appreciate that you change your mobile to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. Finally, please make sure you complete the evaluation form for this session and hand it in before you leave this room. Your feedback and recommendations are very welcome to HEADS. Now, we are ready to start. The title of this presentation is, What Can a Culture of Hispanic STEM Success Look Like? Please welcome Dr. Mary Jo Parker. Now, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining me, and uh, it's just a pleasure being able to present a uh, kind of a historic look at our, our program, which is an academic uh, unit in the College of Science and Technology at the University of Houston downtown. So uh, I'll begin uh, with, I'm an executive director of the Scholars Academy, but I also am in a fact, I'm a faculty member at the, uh, in the natural sciences and the biology unit, so uh, hold two strings. So as an overview very quickly, uh, we're going to look at some changing demographics, some workforce information. Uh, we're a minority service, a, a serving institution that trains undergraduates, uh, not all of whom are uh, underrepresented, but many are underrepresented. And, uh, and then we'll go through some of the program components that create this culture that I talk about. And then finally, uh, how we develop uh, collaborative partnerships that really help us move our students into the graduate uh, terminal degree and or health professionals program and the workforce, of course. Everybody works at the end. So uh, just very quickly, you know, we're in Texas. We're in Houston, Texas. And uh, it's uh, according to the to come new census, third major city in the United States, so very populous. It's what I think the United States will look like in terms of diversity. Uh, and when you consider our, our particular city, we really only have four major universities, four-year universities. So very, for the amount of people, very few universities, but a huge uh, community college system. So we know that we are getting the first step uh, to the education of the student, but the question then becomes, are they finishing, are they going on to a four-year degree? And then uh, very quickly, this is our newest building, the College of Sciences and Technology. It houses the uh, natural science, um, uh, biology, and chemistry faculty. It's really a showcase, uh, glass everywhere. You can see into the labs so that students walking or visitors walking among the laboratories can see students actually doing science. Uh, this is our uh, one of the first uh, buildings that was built following this main campus building. So uh, we're an urban university, very landlocked, uh, but we do have plans to uh, build some additional. Uh, I'll share this right here from here to the ground. It's 14 feet because this is a bayou that runs right next to the uh, university. And actually, two bayous uh, <coughs> across both sides of the university. And I say that because maybe you've heard of Harvey, I know you've heard of Maria here on the island, but uh, in Houston, we, we also uh, have hurricanes and we can have thunderstorms that would produce four inches of rain in an hour or 10 inches of rain in an hour and, and a lot of flooding happens because we are at sea level. Okay, so we are a four-year university. We're HSI and MSI, uh, third most affordable in Texas, and that's a very big uh, factor in who we are educating because we know given any kind of Hispanic or other representation money and we heard it today money really is an issue for students completing their four-year degree 
uh, even two-year degree. So we have right now 14, uh, 41 bachelor's, nine master's degrees, one of which, only one of which is in the College of Science and Technology. So our goal is to be able to increase the amount of master's degrees that we have for our students. And we are seeing the one degree it's in data analytics is just booming. This is the third year. We've already graduated over 30 people in three years. It's an amazing program. So they like the university. They want to continue on to the next level if they have the opportunity. Uh, in our College of Science and Technology, we have about 1,700 to 1,800 uh, majors. And of this 1,700, uh, we make up about 20, 18%, 18 to 20% of the majors in our particular academic unit. Uh, uh, the other thing, 61% uh, of the 15,000 undergrads that we have, have need, and 76% uh, are first generation. So we have a lot of students that don't have that background don't have somebody in their life that had the degree. And so the support services really demand that you, that you know this and that you deal with this in, uh, in an active way. Uh, and I, I put this because um, I was writing something about leadership and uh, uh, about my own leadership style. And, you know, I, uh, I'm a long-term Stephen Covey fan. Begin with the end in mind. What do we want them to be when they leave us? And then we have, they have their own dreams and aspirations, but we have to determine, can we get them there? What, do we, what steps do we take to get them there? And so we always take a family photo, a disaggregate, if you will. Of course, the university is taking their own photos, but we are taking a photo of those who are graduating, and we do track them. What do they do? one year out, two years out, 10 years out. And so we, I'll show you some statistics that are, well, I think amazing. My dean thinks they're pretty amazing. Everybody uses numbers, so they must be a little bit amazing. Uh, just, I think it's very important for you to know that uh, STEM-wise, we do reflect, for the most part, what the downtown campus university looks like, except nationally, uh, you would find uh, everybody uh, a little low on the uh, African-American side, and you'd also find them a little high on the Asian side for STEM undergraduate degrees. So we, we're very reflective of that. And even though this is uh, fall 17 data, this is still true today in 2000. Uh, let's see, so our unit, we, have, uh, we are in our 19th year. So this uh, unit began by two professors, one in uh, computer science and one in uh, chemistry who had won grants and had noticed that their students in STEM, be they underrepresented or not, were not completing. And so they formed this unit with one cohort of 20 people and then thereafter put into place the infrastructure to be able to grow. And uh, then, you know, when I came along 10 years after, uh, we didn't really have any of the data uh, for whatever reason. They weren't, in, they, weren't, they weren't collecting or writing about the data. So my, as I saw it, my job was to get out there, put the data get together, and let people know how well we're doing and where we are baseline and how we're moving forward. Uh, our six year, uh, our students get uh, anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 per year. Considering that we are the third lowest tuition, this is very helpful. It pays almost 60%, if not more. Now, they're not, this isn't the only scholarship they get. Uh, the university gives out a lot of money, and then they have their financial need if they're eligible for that. Uh, disaggregate, 69% uh, graduation rate, and that looks at uh, FTIC first time in college. In Texas, that is the scorecard. So you look at freshmen, first time to come to college, not only do they enter, do they complete, and then that's where the money award comes in. Uh, we have a 74% graduation rate for when you consider all of the transfers. And generally speaking, our four year, our freshmen, we want to finish in uh, four years, four and a half years, 
and the transfer we like them to finish in two to, to three. And the reason for that is they, they spend a lot of time in the, uh, in the community college, which is good, but they're using a lot of their uh, FAFSA, so we need to speed them up as they come to us. Uh, and then finally, a 91% retention rate. And that's a little low, quite honestly, when you think about how many were graduating. And the reason for that is we don't have a uh, per se uh, engineering program. We have engineering technology. And many who come to us transfer out. And so we can't calculate those particular numbers as they come to us. OK, so the, uh, just to give you an idea of the pathways that we have, uh, we have about 51% acceptance to medical school. Uh, you know, all the biology come in wanting to be doctors. And then we know that not everybody's going to get into medical school, but for every two, we uh, are able to get one in. So that's a fairly good uh, acceptance rate. Most, most uh, universities will not, uh, you know, publish anything like this because it's difficult. Right? 44% uh, go on to graduate schools or professional schools. That would include dentistry and optometry, pharmacy, and I won't name all of them, but to give you an idea, 41%. Uh, now that's freshmen, right? 41% of all freshmen. We calculate of all the graduates that we have over the 18, 19 years, how many have gone on to professional schools? About 41%, almost, almost half. And then finally, uh, this is an important uh, data point because our goal is to support, support students to gain employment. You know, I've heard a lot yesterday about workforce programs, and universities generally don't like to talk about that, but that's what the business that we're in. Train them, uh, give them those higher uh, uh, ed critical thinking skills or 21 21st century, as they said today in the plenary, and then get them into a job. I mean, the, the, there is a risk going to college that you will pay more than you will earn as you get out. So it's a real balance for many of us. And quite honestly, I don't think that, uh, you know, I could go to Princeton, and what we say to our stu students is, you know, let uh, come here, let us pay for your undergrad, and then go on to your dream school and let them pay for you to get your doctorate or whatever else you're going to get. Uh, but we do know that we are uh, getting them into the STEM fields. And for STEM, in the United States, this is very important because we, we know that there's a gap of underrepresented. And when you think about the new workforce, it is our students. Uh, and so then 52% uh, when you add these two together, we're coming up with a 91%. All right, so now, uh, just, it's busy. I'm so sorry, it's so busy. This is going to be posted, so you don't necessarily have to uh, take a picture or write anything down. But I think it's important that you see some of the uh, referential information that really supports some of the activities that we are putting together to create a culture of a STEM excellence. And, uh, you, you can look at uh, establishing career topical reviews, very important, we do that. Understanding how research and innovation occurs, we, we know what we're doing in that. Mentored research in the STEM area is a huge motivator and a first step into that research lab at the doctoral or master's level. So very, very important. Uh, teamwork in the workplace, very, very important. We know that the workforce industry uh, representatives are telling us we need more team, so teamwork, soft skills, being able to communicate, being able to present, and being able to work with others. Uh, Peer-led team learning. So we know that this facilitates teamwork, but we also know that peer-led team learning uh, allows students to be, see themselves as leaders, practice leadership skills, because they are guiding other people. And so the leadership idea is very, very important for STEM. And, and one, one thing I will say is that even at the undergraduate level, when you think about an engineer who may not go and get a master's degree, they will rise in the company and or wherever they're working 
because they have those critical thinking skills, those problem solving skills, the ability to communicate, and they will be seen at, by others as leaders and have to take on those positions even though they may not want to be a leader. They may just want to be an engineer, whatever that means, right? Uh, solve a problem. But they're going to be seen by others. So it's very important that we guide them in learning leadership. And then we do course reviews and study sessions, very important to get them through. Uh, facilitating skill development, very research skill <coughs> development, very, very important. Uh, if, you, if you've not seen Lopato, uh, he has several articles, one 2007, 2009, 2010, and he's done research with uh, looking at REUs or summer undergraduate research experiences and how impactful that is to uh, the young undergraduate's perception of competence and confidence to go on into a graduate program or a professional program. So very important research that, you know, if you haven't looked at it, I will look at it. Uh, looking, we have to know the predominant barriers First, gener first, uh, first year courses, of course, and the fact that they don't, they don't have a cohort to uh, tap into. They don't have anybody at home that can give them insight into what was it like when you went to college. And so they, you've got to connect them quickly. And uh, many of these uh, particular references will talk about that. And, and, and again, in STEM, because that's my area, STEM is about uh, knowing what it's really like. I mean, I'm a first generation. I went to college. I was, a, I was the second in my family, but first to graduate. And when I want, and I knew I wanted a doctorate, but I had no idea what that was. And even when I went to Baylor University, they didn't really tell us what it was. It's like we were supposed to know uh, so what we try to inform that, you know, many love our university because our, our faculty, our PhDs are so nurturing and they want to teach at a university. We happen to be a te teaching university. What they don't know is when you get the PhD, that's about research. It's about contributing to the field, contributing to, you know, teaching is an aside except at our university, right? And they don't know this, so you have to inform them of that. And then finally, mentoring. Mentoring is so very important, not only from the faculty, but absolutely from their peers. So I'll show you the system that we put together that propagates this culture that I'm talking about. Uh, this is our system, and so what we've done is we have broken them into uh, discipline-based groups. We give them a, peer, a faculty mentor and a peer mentor and then they guide these students and they meet once a month over the five months of each semester and with a very pointed agenda. You know, first it's networking, second it's uh, uh, getting together to produce a, a service project. You know, this notion of, so we're giving you money and we want you to give back to our community. Get connected to the community that you came from or something similar. And uh, it, it's been very, uh, productive in terms of what they learn. Now each uh, faculty mentor produces a field trip and, and why? Well we call them broadening experiences because as I said all the bio uh, students, majors, they want to be doctors and we know that that some will become doctors but many uh, don't even know there's anything other than, a do than uh, medical, right? Uh, they, they don't have that awareness. They know about medicine because they've gone to a doctor in some form or fashion. So this is our structure that, uh, and then these uh, peer mentors, you notice we have a senior peer mentor and a peer mentor coordinator. So we train these in leadership. This is another level of leadership. Uh, but I think communication is one of the key factors to creating the culture. So what we offer is a weekly digest where we do compilations of summer internships, of opportunities, of employment. 
just by putting an announcement for a job, uh, let's say a data analyst that doesn't have a prereq of being a uh, math major, you know, a lot of people can do data analytics without being a math major. And so just announcing opportunities broadens their perspective. Uh, then uh, we have a Blackboard, a uh, member-only Blackboard organization where we will post certain inf information that only the members can get to. Uh, that's where they sign up for field trips. So we're giving them, they can post, maybe they want to sell a book. We do it carefully because we have a bookstore. But they can sell to each other if they want. I, we do monitor that so that we don't, we want to know what they're selling. Yeah. You know? And then uh, we do have Facebook. You know, we used to be very, very big in Facebook, and we're, we're still, we have a presence, but we backed off a little bit. Uh, we had some incidences, I would say my third year, where uh, some information was out there uh, that wasn't appropriate, so we backed off a little bit. Uh, the university has a big Facebook presence, so we let them do a lot of it. Twitter, we occasionally, I, will, I do have a Twitter, I'll send out some information. Uh, but you know, STEM majors, oh I hate to say it this way, but STEM majors are very busy, right? They're not, and, and forgive me if I insult you if you're a psych major, everybody's busy in college, but some majors have more or less time for more freedom and more other things outside of the class. The STEM majors, they're just going to class and labs all the time. So we don't do a whole lot of that. We are going to start an Instagram. We saw one of our clubs, the uh, uh, Association for uh, Computing Machinery, which is like the computer science club. And they are very active here. And they, so I, I was like this better than this, right? Because you can, uh, you have a little more control as to who sees it. And then finally, we get all of our organization, about 200, who are on scholarship together twice a, a year at the uh, orientation session. And then they, they get to see how large an organization we are. And we share with them any changes in the uh, structure or the, I don't say policies, the guidelines that we put in place. Uh, and then finally, we do have open doors. I mean, my door is always open for the most part. If it's closed, it means I'm grant writing but they can come in at any point in time. So uh, we're like a home base, so to speak. We don't want to be like a home base in high school. We want to be a little bit different. They, and, and they do, you know, I will tell you that this semester I've had uh, one student that just got out of the hospital and he's emailing me in December during the holidays and then coming back saying I finally got out of the hospital, I finally can pay my bill. Am I still, part? I said, absolutely. I mean, I've had people with cancer. You know, we're not going to throw them out. We're going to keep them in. Uh, we had, we actually developed a new, we do put people on probation. We take money away from them because this, not everybody gets scholarships to take their coursework. And so uh, we wanted to keep our freshmen with us. And we have a, a level of 2.7 or you're dismissed and we went down to 2.6 this this semester because we had five freshmen that are brilliant who didn't get it but we want to keep them with us and so we put a, together a, a, a p2 if you will <laughs> probationary two all right very quickly so uh, we do have a five-point program and I won't go through all of it but uh, part of what works for us is that we, we do, in the summers, if you notice right here, we, we, we don't want to lose touch with them. It's important we bring them, bring them in, the freshmen, to make sure they're at the right math level. We don't want you starting at uh, college algebra because already you're behind <coughs> in your course load. You're going to four and a half to five years which the state allows, but we don't have that kind of money to support them for five years. So we want them to get on with it. Now, all of our students have to take 12 hours, a full load, so that they can show progress. 
And then uh, we do have, uh, in July, we bring them back, and we have professors that will open their labs and do certain, uh, with, their, with their undergraduate assistants, do certain experiments so they get a better idea of what is available at UHD. This is always eye-opening. They don't know that we have so many opportunities for them. And the, the biggest advantage we have is that they can uh, get involved in research as a second semester freshman. They don't have, at a tier one, they're not going to put them into a PI's lab that's a $3 million or $3 billion grant. They won't do it. They're going to wait for the master's degrees, the postdocs to get in there. They're not gonna put an undergraduate because they're, they're not as well trained. And the depth of their knowledge isn't there. So, so our advantage is that they can get involved in research in a deep way. We do a, a special week-long program to bring all the freshmen in. This is separate from the university. They're doing their orientation. But this is very pointed. So this is, this is the formation of the cohort. And then this cohort will move into this seminar course all together. And quite honestly, I, to me, this is the advantage that we have. We bring in almost 50 every fall freshmen, which isn't a lot, but these 50 are moving forward and they're graduating at that 44% uh, rate. And actually it's a little bit higher now. I'll give you those numbers in a little bit. So we get to have our own seminar, which is a core course. We do the same thing for the, set of the transfer students. The transfer students, uh, actually we were doing this transfer seminar well before the university said we need a transfer seminar. And the reason we were doing it is because, uh, think about a transfer, they have at most two years. And they've not done research generally at a community college. And you've got to get, uh, get them integrated into the research program or what will they do when they graduate. Now, if they're engineering, they. Uh, technology, they know that they're going to go into a job. But for the rest of them, they've got to have some experiences, uh, fall or spring academic semester, so that they can apply to the summer research programs in the single summer that they have. Now, I will say this, if you don't get your students, it's fine to have them on campus doing research. If you don't get them into external experiences, they're really not going to know what it's like. And they will, when they go to the graduate programs, they will have a difficult time of adjustment because the, the tier ones that have the programs or the medical schools that have the program, you know, they are at a higher level. They, they want excellence and good, good work ethic. So for us, we have almost 80 per summer that are going to external programs. And we have a mandate, this is a terrible requirement, that our students apply to two every semester. They don't have to win that, they just have to apply. Because if you don't apply, you cannot win it. And we have very good GPAs. And then with the academic experiences in research labs that they bring, they're a hop, step, and a foot away from, you know, experiencing what a tier one PhD program would be like. Uh, we've had many that didn't go external, that went to graduate programs, that ended up going, and, and it's fine, maybe it wasn't right for them, but they ended up going into the workforce. So you've got to prepare them, and talking about it is just not enough. They've got to experience it for themselves and up their game. And then finally, uh, well, we've already done that. So both seminars introduce research in some form or fashion and, and teamwork. And then I've already said enough about that, right? Well, one other thing. So we did have uh, apply for these national labs and other undergraduate research programs. But mainly, we, we prepare them. In the fall, every fall, they have to produce a personal, C, uh, personal uh, CV. And then that, they talk with their faculty mentor and they get feedback so that there's four years 
of improvement. And then in the spring, they do a curriculum veto. Now, why? Because every research program asks for that. And every graduate program or medical school wants that. So we can't leave it to chance. They've got to be improving in an ongoing manner. Now, uh, notice we don't put resume up there, but, <coughs> excuse me, you can uh, take your CV and you can quickly and relatively easily convert that to a, a resume. Uh, and there's so many varieties of resumes because of the given job description that it's that, a little futile. Okay, so again, we do broadening experiences. Now, we're very lucky. We're in the fourth largest medical center in the United States. Some say the world. Uh, MD Anderson and the Texas Medical Center, and they, because we have a legacy of people going on to graduate or medical degrees, we, people know of us. And so they send us or the dean or professors who have worked there and uh, they will send us, we need a person. And then we will send in return uh, people that are ready to graduate, that have experience and will get their credentials and send them forward. And then they go through the interview. We don't, we don't decide who gets it, they decide. Um, so we, we also bring the, uh, the graduate programs to us and this is nationwide. So we have a graduate school and internship fair. We, if we had a bigger campus, we would host more, but we uh, host well over 60 graduate school internship fair uh, participants free. Somebody uh, the other day said, well, they charge. I would love to charge, but I, I'm going, no, I think I can run my program without charging. So we want them to come, and then they bring their internships, they interview for graduate programs, et cetera. So we're bringing, when you think about the 76% that are first time, the first generation, we can't wait for those students to go out and seek. We have to bring, you know, close that gap of opportunity and access by bringing the people to our campus. And so we do that. And then finally, we also have a university-wide um, uh, student research conference. What's very different about this one is that we bring a keynote alumnus that has a terminal degree. And when I first came, our list was somewhat short. And in over the 10 years that I've been there, uh, we now have a list of 20 that I'm going to present next week, actually, at our meeting and say, okay, who do you want? I just went on Facebook and I saw somebody else just finished her degree. Uh, and I'm going, oh, we need to add her, right? And she's, this story is very exciting. She went to uh, Cal, Cal State Fullerton, no, Irvine. Is that University of California, UC, Irvine? UC, UC, UC Irvine. Irvine, thank you. And she's a DACA student and she's, she's testified before Congress. They took scholarship money away from, or fellowship money away from her there. She's fought that system the whole time and I just saw where she finished her degree. I mean, it's very exciting. And I, I almost think she is gonna be put at the top of that lid, you know, isn't that terrible? Because this is a fantastic story. The others are good, but this is like she struggled. And we have. But she also wanted to be a doctor and she finally figured out, I can't do that. I need to go PhD, and so it worked. Uh, anyway, uh, we also write a lot of grants so that we can fund these students to national conferences. Because here's what the national conference presentations do. Now they don't go just to look, they have to present, they have to be accepted to present. And then this helps build the CV of the professors, the PhDs that sponsor them. But for them, it exposes them to other students like them. And they see <clears throat> what is available and what is out there and they, they learn to network as well. Now our graduate school internship is about networking, so they get practice, but here's where they refine. And then finally, uh, you know, we used to do, I'll tell you quite honestly, we spend a lot of money on GRE workshops with our professors leading them for 15 students. And now what we do, uh, and it is the reason I remain with HEADS, uh, 
you know, we use this online uh, GRE and other prep center. Very, very important. Our students are signing up for it. We train them. We do a seminar. We tell the uh, uh, peer mentors, talk about this, get them signed in, <coughs> show them how to use it so that they can uh, take advantage of all that information. And then further, so I've already uh, talked, we want them to know how to present and how to communicate. And part of these programs that we put on are, uh, are how we do that. So these are just an example of some of the conferences that our students go to. Right? And again, they're being prepped by their professors so that uh, they can present themselves and our university as a quality institution. Uh, we, we do train them how to do a poster, how to refine your oral presentation, uh, and then we have them also develop a bio sketch, a cover letter, we already talked about this, and the personal statements. Now why? Because there are instances where I'll have companies say, we want, give us three people. Well, if we don't do a bio sketch, and that's professional development, right? You need to be able to say what you've done and, and then the rest of it. They need to be prepared. They need to have it ready. Even if it's an immature freshman, sophomore level, I've had freshman students who came with 30 hours who got accepted to a national REU. I'm going, how in the world did you get that? But great. And then that begets another REU and that begets entrance into University of Arizona, Biosphere. I mean, it's amazing what they do. And just so you have to have some images, right? Now I'll tell you, you notice that, well most, I don't know who that is, most are in suits, right? Uh, when I first came, they would do the graduate school and internship fair, and they, we have a casual uh, polo shirt with khakis. We don't give them the khakis, they have to buy their own pants, but we give them the shirt. And, uh, and I said, well, that is very nice. They look very uniform. But the next year, I said, no, we're all gonna wear suits. We're gonna do professional dress. And then I had some ladies in, uh, I mean, stilettos with the sequence and I said okay we have to train them a little better and <laughs> and very short you know that was like the uh, early 2000s that it came and so we said no that's not appropriate so we we do uh, well we have our peer mentors when we train them it's off-site at a retreat in the woods where you can't get phone service and then they put together a skit of what the most important uh, <coughs> item is that we need to train everybody on. <clears throat> and so now we have, I mean, I have graduate programs coming up to me saying, oh my gosh, they look so professional. Isn't that what I want people to say about them, right? <clears throat> so uh, what we're doing, this, our focus this semester, and uh, I left a video because I'm supposed to be at an orientation, but uh, it's about professionalism because they, they dress and look good, but they don't know not to go up to a speaker and say, can you sign this form for me? You know, we've got to go further and say, here's what's appropriate, when it's appropriate. And they have to be able to, you know, we take a lot for granted. We went to college. We had somebody in our life that guided us and that maybe still guides us. We cannot take those items for granted. That is that cultural nature. We have to build it for them, show them, demo for them, because they may not get it with a little paper that says, here are your guidelines of how to act, right? We have to do more. Uh, anyway, and you know, here, we love this, when they're getting prizes and monies. You know, then that's sad. This young girl, she's in graduate school. She's about to finish her doctorate in uh, University of Alabama. Uh, but wonderful, wonderful success programs. All right, finally, so leadership, I've talked a lot about that. I'll just basically go through that. We do train the peer mentors. So we, we have a peer leader program where they get trained. And the peer, peer leader program means that they may help in a classroom 
but they're developing their leadership skills and then they may be selected or apply to the peer mentor program where it's more organizational where we want people that can guide their groups and then finally uh, we have ambassadors we started this five years ago and they're an extension of our office so we want students who can represent our university represent our program and you know they're nearer the age of the recruits so they're going to be more enthusiastic our program helped the university uh, develop their own gator guide and that is a, essentially an ambassador program where they are sending students out to represent our university uh, finally of course the small learning communities you've already seen that but we do believe in that giving back that service project you know many of our students are very uh, economically disadvantaged however when they go back into the community in a stem focused manner whatever it is i'll give you an example in just a minute whatever it is they're going to do they uh they see how lucky they are and they are more appreciative right and they, then they also model because they are very diverse they model for those younger students you can do it look i did it and uh, I, we take uh, post-semester surveys where they give us feedback on these uh, activities and it's amazing what they integrate into their own being uh, one example of a service project uh, we challenged them uh, this was about six years ago. you know they all want to clean the beach pick up trash well that's nice but <laughs> Let's get it STEM related. And so one of our computer science uh, groups, peer groups, they found that one of the, the Houston Independent School District had three campuses that were building computers. They, they'd gotten donations, but they weren't up to date. And so they said they would go and help. And there they were with the young person who was gonna get the computer, breaking it down, loading it, put it, building it together, loading the software. I mean, isn't that what CS is about? And, you know, I get chills every time I think about it because those groups have continued that service to today. It's amazing. But it's very connected to their STEM career goals. Um, and then we do, and I don't say very much about this, but we do, uh, I, I hesitate to call it training, we uh, debrief our faculty mentors every semester. We'll meet before the semester, we'll meet after the semester. Because we will notice things and they will notice things. And this is how we improve the organization. You know, the faculty are very quick to say, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Sometimes they're at odds with each other and then we have to make a decision. But we try to listen, absolutely listen to them. Okay, these are some research uh, projects. You could, that's a professor right there, a professor right here. They're all faculty mentors but very active and these are not staged this was actually happening so as much summer research as we can afford we pay the students to go in and learn now some of these students are fresh they're not freshmen they're pre-college and they may come to our program to to get some skills uh, just some examples i think what i'll point out here is we write a lot of grants, a lot of grants. We just wanted another department, this is the new one right here, Department of Ed, uh, Minority Serving uh, uh, Educational Improvement Grant from the Department of Ed. And you've got to do it because you've got to support them. They need the extra money. And the other thing is they can use the paid summer or academic year mentor research as a job experience. So when, when they go to apply for a job and they're asked what experiences, instead of saying, I have nothing, I have not worked yet, they can't, they're not, that's not a true statement because if you're earning money, you are working, even if it's a stipend or a scholarship or whatever. Then finally, okay, I've already talked about that, I won't go on about that, and just some nice pictures of our graduate uh, school of, this is actually our student research uh, but this is very important you know I would say to you if you 
have a list of your prominent alumni who, ha who have reached that terminal degree or have that various and vast experiences, bring them back to your campuses. It is awe-inspiring. And they want to tell why and how they accomplished. I mean, it's very, just inspiring is the only word I can say. Uh, now, we do collect a lot of data. And this is just essential. You have to know where you came from and how are you improving if you're improving. So we disaggregate from the whole university. And we also get back a value added that our program adds to the College of Science and Technology and the greater graduate uh, graduation rate for the university. So, uh, you know, we have alumni uh, emails. The PhDs will update us on who they know that have finished. And then we maintain an access database and use Excel as, as well. And we calculate all the gradu who graduated within four or five or six years. So we have five, 10 minutes, plenty. And then we, we absolutely work hand in hand with our institutional effectiveness office because you have to have real numbers to be able to share with you all. Uh, now we, we do use College Warehouse. You know, I have a little uh, about College Warehouse because it's all in how you pull the data, whether you get good data or <coughs> semi-good data or other kinds of data. I won't say poor, but okay. And then uh, our Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board does uh, give reports to UHD as to how we're doing and then we're now, now on PeopleSoft. We were on Banner. And you know, we're learning it. That's the problem with people. It's very, very powerful, uh, but we're learning it. We do use our assistant dean for advising, who is an expert in the PeopleSoft, and so we're generating now queries so that we can more quickly and effectively pull the data that we need to be able to uh, finish reports, et cetera. Well, we were uh, out of the assessment office. We had in our college uh, an assessment uh, Person. And so they looked at uh, 2014 to, to, to current. And so they wanted to see, well, what is our graduate in a disaggregate way? What is our graduation rate? So I was very pleased with what we found. Uh, so again, they're only looking at freshmen, but over those f first four years that have finished, we had a 70%. Even though it's only 122, but 70% graduation rate, this is impressive if you ask me. And I'll tell you why it's impressive, and this will be the next slide. Uh, so we took that disaggregate rate, and here's where we would, if we were, we're not our own university, we're a component of a university. But look, we are number three. We are right in the thick of the major tier one universities as our program is producing STEM graduates. So that's very important. Now our overall university rate, uh, graduation rate, they're raising it. Uh, they're working to raise it right now. It's about 20%. It was much lower when I first came in. So, uh, but we like to, I think this is a, a bragging point, quite honestly. And then finally, uh, just to give you an idea, so when we talked about where we began, uh, one of our first graduates is an MD. This is our most recent graduate, and she was in the first cohort, and it took her a while, 10 years, but uh, she finished her PhD and now is part of the uh, administration of the Herman Memorial, or Memorial Herman Health System. And I just pulled a few to give you an idea, but look at this. I mean, these are just amazing. These are just single. We have more than this, and I'll give you some numbers right now. So from 1999 to 2018, we produced 64 MDs and 79 PhDs or otherwise terminal degrees. I mean, look, we have them continuing on. And then my dean was very excited about this. In uh, 18 years, we have this. But in the last three years, we produced 24 and 22. Three years worth of graduates. And in the last 15 months, 10 PhD, and that would be different now because we know that one just graduated and three MDs. So it's a legacy. It's a legacy that others can say, man, we have so many proofs of concept that this is working. 
Uh, and then finally, we couldn't do this without all of our partners. And we won't name everybody, and we have more than these. But you, we've got to connect, right? We're ready to connect to EDP because they have a nursing program. And they have, and, and uh, Intra Americana has a law school program. And there are STEM people that want to go into law. I'm not sure why, but they want to go into law, <laughs> right? So we, we have California, we have places. Oh my gosh, she got many signs. Okay, now how do we facilitate the partnership very quickly? Well, I, we have an advisory council and we bring them in for feedback, input, and then we try to work some of that into it. Uh, we are part of the pre-college leadership program. We do have open houses, we participate in just a lot of places, right? We bring people, we use these two venues to bring guests in to see what our students look like. Talk to them, see posters. All right, that's it. One minute left, yes? <laughs> right? Thank y'all, and if you have any questions, happy to answer them. So I hope you see the cultural realm of what we did. I think it's, it's multifaceted and uh, we change by tweaking. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But anyway, good luck. I hope something will help you that you've heard. Thank you.